How's everybody doing? Good? Okay, cool. I think we got a little... All right, perfect. So today we're going to be showcasing a part one of four part series on world creation and character building inside of Maxon One Tools. We're going to be starting with ZBrush and a little bit of Substance Painter um, towards the end to kind of showcase how you actually can take some of your works that you see here on the screen and actually start bringing it to your, your uh, final product. Ultimately, then we're going to have a couple of trainers. We're going to have Ellie come up next. She's going to showcase Cinema 4D and Redshift and how she can continue taking the work that I did and make the scene bigger and better. So you're going to want to stick around because for the next four hours, we're going to have a lot of really good information. But today we're going to be talking about ZBrush and more specifically here, this little guy right here. His name is Axel Rose. He's a little fun accidental character that we made for this whole project. So if you're new to ZBrush or what ZBrush is, we're going to go through a little getting started. But real quick, just to kind of show you, here's Substance Painter right now. We have the character textured. And if we pop back to ZBrush, you can actually see that this is the character that we're working on. And he's actually final post here. And something, too, to showcase is that if I actually come here to the texture, you can see that you can take this, the, the textures from Substance Painter. I'm going to hide all the poly paint. I'm going to come down here. You can turn this on and off, and you can see that the textures actually can be brought back over for your final project. So let's go ahead and showcase a couple steps real fast on how to get started, especially for those online who want to follow, or if you want to look back at this later. So let me get my Wacom tablet here. We're going to go ahead and pause this character. We're just going to go ahead and spotlight him right here. So to spotlight anything as reference on your screen, Shift-S will actually do a little bit of a stamp clone. So this is where you can actually take a look at some of your projects and different sizes, and then you can continue working and still have reference on the side of what you're already working on. Control-N will clear that for you. So how do I get started in ZBrush? This is a question I get a lot, and at the end of the day, within five minutes, you'll start sculpting no problem. So let's go ahead and when you load up ZBrush for the first time, pretend there's not a mushroom back here, you're going to go ahead and get something that looks a lot like this. And what you're going to do to get started in ZBrush is you're going to hit this little X. Now, before I hit this X, just real quick, that we actually have a lot of information that pops up here every time you open up ZBrush, specifically live streams, events, stuff like NAB. Also, you can see here we have a May the 4th stream coming up. I'll have a QR code up in a bit that you can scan for more information. But you're going to go ahead and close this little button. And then to get started sculpting, all you really need to do is this little default project, you're going to double click this. And when you double click this, it's going to ask you, do you want to save? Just say no. And automatically, you can start sculpting on ZBrush. So just in those few steps, you're already in the program. You don't have to worry about how you can get started. You can just come through here and start laying down clay. The next step I'm going to take you to is to the left, right here on this little button. This is our brush palette. Now, when I click this brush palette one time, you're going to see a ton of brushes, and this usually freaks everybody out. But do not worry, because this brush can actually be, this menu can be brought down just a little bit. For example, I'm a clay sculptor. I like the sculpting clay. I want a clay brush. So when I open this menu up, either by clicking this button or hitting B on the keyboard, if I hit C for clay, notice it narrows it down within just a few seconds. And now I can quickly see that there's a bunch of brushes, but now I'm also looking at this little orange icon. And this is the hotkey shortcut for that brush. So every time you open up the brush palette, you hit B, then you hit C for clay. And now I see, oh, look, I have a clay brush. That's L. So then you're going to hear me say a lot, oh, I want the clay brush, B, C, L. Or if I want the clay buildup brush, B, C, B. If I want the damn standard to do any type of scribing, that's B, D, S. So you're going to hear that a lot, especially if you watch any live streams. But here, that's just a quick way to navigate through your favorite brushes. What I really recommend anybody do who's new to ZBrush is do not worry about trying to make something perfect out the gate. I know we're showcasing world building and character creation today, but I would love for people to just come in and just start playing and finding their favorite brushes. When you find your favorite brush, you can kind of make a mental note of what that does. Here's a VDM brush, which is a vector displacement map that allows you to come through and actually bring out shapes that are custom to ZBrush right away. So if I want some scales on the back of this guy, I can immediately just start getting some scale work. If I want a weird eyeball, I can pop in some eyes. 
If I want a horn for a nose, it's my world, my choice, right? I can go ahead and just start creating my character. So automatically, I'm starting to see something come to life. This is how you should really start opening and getting involved with ZBrush, because it's really just going to help you create freely and effectively. Now, going back to that clay buildup brush, if I hit BCB, now we have two main buttons on the keyboard that you really want to play with. You have the smooth, uh, you have the shift button, and you have the alt button. We're going to start with the alt button first, because what happens is if I start sculpting, you'll notice I have like a little bit of a uh, positive, I'm adding clay. But what if I want to take clay away? If I press and hold alt on the keyboard, now I'm like cutting into it. So I can actually come through here and start cutting in maybe a little bit of a cavity. And right above at the very top, I have a couple sliders where I could take the draw size and make my brush size bigger, or I can make my brush size much smaller and get some finer details. So just in those few little steps, you're already creating in ZBrush. And from there, it's up to you to decide what world you want to create. Now let's create something fun and simple for everybody to follow along. So I'm going to introduce this timeline up here. This is our history timeline. It saves pretty much anything you do up until the time you close the, uh, the file. Or if you want to save, we'll get into that a little bit later, but you can save this information for, for future projects. Well, I'm going to go all the way back and just drag that back to the beginning as if none of that happens. Now let's go ahead and just sculpt a mushroom to get our feet wet a little bit. So I'm going to introduce the move brush, which is B for brush, M for move, and then I have a hotkey shortcut, V, so BMV. And now I can go ahead and press and hold the S button or come back up and just bring up my draw size, and I can start moving clay around. Now, this we have a lot of these menus that pop up from time to time. These are super important. What this is telling me is that I did 45 steps, and I went back in time, and I started sculpting again. And it's like, hey, do you want to lose that history or not? And it's like, for me, yeah, this is a demo. We can lose it, but it's something to kind of keep in mind. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And when I press OK, boop, right there. Now it's going to let me continue, but that history bar went away. But we're not worried about that right now. We're just worried about sculpting. So from here, you can see I can start moving some clay around. Well, let's make the shape of the mushroom a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to introduce the gizmo brush. So if I hit W, this gizmo allows me to move my object around in space, and everything from rotation to moving to going up and down, even scaling, all of that is active at the same time. So you don't have to really go through and say WERT. You can just come through, turn the gizmo on, and actually rotate. Now you notice that the started stretching effect. That's because in this project that we open, we have symmetry turned on by default. Symmetry is a great way as an artist to start sculpting with getting the, the symmetry right on, so one side's good on the other, you don't have to repeat yourself, you don't have to do asymmetrical sculpting. But let's say I do want to turn that off. Well, I can just hit X on the keyboard, and now that symmetry is off. And the reason why we'd want to do that is because I actually want to scale this and make this look a little bit more like a mushroom. So I'm going to go ahead and actually maybe stretch this up a little bit, flail this out just like that. Now I'm going to go ahead and press and hold Control and Shift together, and that's going to isolate a lot of these brushes here. And that's the next part, the, the shift button. The shift button, if you just press shift, introduces a smooth brush, which allows me to smooth clay down. Now, you can't really see that, so let's do this. And you can see now I can like smooth it, right? But with combination brushes like control and shift, I can isolate certain brushes to just select brushes. So now I can pick something like, let's say, the clip curve. And I'm going to press and hold shift and control and drag out a line. Now, you might see that there's a shadow. The shadow side is the side that's going to vanish or disappear. When I let go of that, now that kind of pops that down. And really what the clip curve brush did was took all that geo and smushed it right up against it, giving me the shape that I wanted. But this doesn't quite look like a mushroom yet. So let's go ahead and introduce one other thing that's going to take us through the majority of this project, and that is manipulating symmetry with radial symmetry. So if I want to actually manipulate and get like a nice fun shape, I can use the move brush, going back to B for brush, M for move, and then the V. But I'm going to go ahead and come on up to the top here to our transform. And here is where my active symmetry lies. If I turn on active symmetry, now I have a few axes to work off of. And more specifically, I have this radial symmetry button. 
Now in ZBrush, the X axis is from left to right, screen left, screen right. Y is up and down, and Z is Z depth. So here, I'm gonna turn on Y so that I can work around this on that up and down scale. And then I'm gonna go ahead and turn R. Now I got a lot of stuff happening because I forgot to turn X off. And now I have, go ahead and I have this. Now, let's go ahead real fast, send this back home. So with symmetry turned on now, I can start manipulating the shape and giving me just a nice little mushroom cap just like that. So really, really simple. I can do a light smooth, and now we're almost there. I can even come up in the side and kind of push this in a bit, give it a little bit of a shadow, press and hold shift, and I can go ahead and smooth this down just a bit. Now, of course, here we're at NAB, so I am kind of going through this a little quickly, but this will be recorded, so you can always go back and, and play with it a bit more. Now, I want to go ahead and make this look like the mushroom because it needs a stem. Now, here's something with ZBrush is that when people first get in ZBrush, they think, I have a sphere. Everything needs to be made from that sphere. And that's not true. We can actually bring in other objects or what we call subtools to into the scene to make the scene a little bit more palatable and a little bit more controllable. So if I go to subtool here on the right hand side, you'll notice that this giant tool menu, we only need a few objects here. We don't need to worry about every single menu because that's too daunting. We just want to get started. So I'm going to go ahead and say insert, and now I have some primitive shapes that I can pick from. I'm going to go ahead and pick a cylinder because that's much like a stem of a mushroom. And now I can go ahead, turn on the gizmo by hitting W, scale this down, maybe stretch it up a little bit. And now we're getting something that I kind of like. Now, going back to the radial symmetry that we just did with the mushroom cap, back up to transform, activate that symmetry, close down the x-axis, turn on the y-axis and that radial symmetry, and now I can come through, maybe squeeze this down, stretch this out, and get something a little bit more like what I would like to do. Now, at this point too, what I'm going to really advocate is naming convention is pretty key when you're building your scenes, especially if you're working with clients and they want to know what you've done. So on the subtool side, on the right-hand side, we have a couple options. We're just going to go ahead and say rename, and I'll go ahead and call this my stem. And then this top one, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this one time. So I'm going to go ahead and duplicate that. And the reason for that is ZBrush on the subtool palette, when we save our projects, the actual first subtool is going to go ahead and take the naming convention of your file. And the reason for this, too, that, that I think really benefits the scene is that when you're working in ZBrush, sometimes it's good to have like a backup base mesh really lets you experiment. So for this one, I'm going to go ahead and leave this alone. But the second one, I'll call this my, my cap. And from here, let's just go over saving real fast. So we have our project on the tool side. You notice I've just been clicking the far right side and just dragging. That's because we can util utilize our mouse and just click and drag. I'm going to go ahead and just save as. This is going to go ahead and save tools. And we're just going to call this our mushroom. Boop. And you'll notice now that that first uh, tool took that naming convention on. And so now we have this backup, but we also have the naming convention for us. And we're going to go ahead and start moving forward. Now we want, we're going to want to go ahead and texture this too because we don't want just a basic mushroom. So we're going to introduce a really cool, uh, really interesting and really fun, super cool feature called Dynamesh. Now what Dynamesh does is this is the power of ZBrush. It lets us manipulate and control the shapes of our objects and rebuild our mesh very, very fast. For example, with this, if I pick something like the snake cook brush, so I go B for brush, S for snake, and then H for the snake cook. Go ahead and say OK. What this is going to let me do now is that if I want to make a really cool change, I can go ahead and pull this out. Now notice I just shredded the mesh, right? This is not good geometry at all. But that's OK, because if I press and hold Control and drag off on the side, now what this did was it, it went ahead and it rebuilt my mesh as best as it can. So I can go ahead and smooth this area out and go ahead and rebuild. I can even combine this with other brushes, come through, inflate this area just a little bit, maybe smooth that down, and just rebuild this. And now I have full control of my shape. This is what ZBrush is really letting us do is the ability to come through and just work effectively. Let's go ahead and skip that note. So we can actually come through here and make the shapes and changes that we want. And we're just working freely. 
then this is something that we really wanted to provide to artists because artists think on the, on the fly. We're like, oh, I want this shape. No, now I want this shape. The ability to just come in and start making changes however you want, that's super important to every ZBrush artist. And we want to make sure that you have the whole pipeline and control in your hands. Now, I'm going to go ahead and back this up a little bit and say we have something like this. Yeah, let's back it up a little bit more, just a, just a teeny bit, because I'm also indecisive. I'll have something like that. Now let's bring a little bit of texturing to it. So I'm going to go ahead and hit solo down here at the bottom. That's going to just let me look at one object at one time. And now I'm going to bump up the resolution just a tiny bit. So under the DynaMesh, I'm actually going to bring my slider, my resolution slider, up just a little bit. The lower the number, the lower the mesh quality. So if I bring this down to, let's say, 32, maybe even lower than that, let's say eight for fun, that's super, super low. And this is just so you can get your block outs. But the higher the number you go, the more dense your mesh is gonna be. And the reason why we'd want some density is to actually add a little bit of some sort of texturing, some sort of like detail to this so it looks a little cooler than just this flat surface. So again, I'm gonna come through, just kind of smooth that down, kind of rebuild that a little bit. Now let's do some texturing. So I'm gonna hit B for brush, S for standard, and then T for the standard brush. This is probably my favorite brush for doing any type of just random detail. And if you'll notice right here on the left-hand side, I have pointed you to this brush palette, but underneath it, we have stroke, and then we have alphas. And this is what's gonna be really cool, is we can start combining different ways of utilizing the same brush and provide different alphas, which will give us different results. So if I wanted to have like, just little bulbous areas that are perfectly circle. I'm going to drag this dra uh, drag rec stroke with this alpha that's pretty, yeah, let's go alpha six. It's a nice kind of soft fall off. But if I go ahead and start dragging this out, you'll notice I'm starting to see a little bit of an alpha, but it's really low res. So we're going to bump up that intensity. And now we can see, we can start adding some of these little bulbous areas. And before you know it, we're actually getting something that's looking a little bit more like the mushroom cap that I want. I'm just going to drag on a couple of these right about there. And again, this what this brush is letting me do is when I start dragging, I can make it as big or as small as I want. And here it's affecting the geometry. And if I stretch that geometry too much, I can just rebuild. And now I have a little bit more detail. So if I turn solo back off, come back up to my sub tool on the right hand side. Let's go ahead and hide that one. Let's like switch that because I detailed the wrong one. There we go. So now you can see here that we're actually getting something that looks pretty, pretty cool. Now, if you want to actually start moving into more detail, DynaMesh is a workflow that lets you block out very, very quickly, but I wouldn't recommend using it for high detail capture because in ZBrush, the vertices is going to hold all of that detail information. And right now, we're just relying on just simple quads that are just randomly thrown together to give us a little bit of a look. What ZBrush is really good at is subdivisions. Subdivisions is the key to working in high geometry levels and holding a lot of detail. And the way we can do that is we can actually use this feature called ZBrushMesher. So if I actually go ahead and right up here at the top where this timeline is, we're gonna be utilizing this to use projection to take that back to the mesh. So I'm going to go ahead and say control tap right up here. That's going to give us a little white dot. What you really need to remember is that it's just there to store that information at its current point in time. So now I'm going to go through and on the right hand side under the tool menu, I'm going to drag to geometry. I'm going to close DynaMesh and open up ZBrushMesher. And now I can actually pick a few different target polys. Basically, I'm gonna give you the secret sauce right out the gate to get really nice apology quickly in ZBrush. From here, this is our target polys, meaning we're working in thousands. How many thousands of quads do I want this stretched over? The lower the better when you're working with subdivision level one, but we're gonna to wanna to project. So I would usually say start somewhere around 10, which you could type in any number that's highlighted like this. And then I'm gonna say keep groups. Now I haven't introduced polygroups yet, but if you're here yesterday, you might have seen sense where polygroups if I go ahead and hold Shift and F, this is a poly group. These are color selections that you can utilize to isolate and control your mesh the way you would like. But I'm gonna go ahead and say, keep this down to zero. And then I'm gonna say adaptive size down to zero. What this is telling ZBrush is I want even quads across my mesh surface, but I still want it to adapt 
to the surface as is, meaning it's going to try its best to give me nice even topology everywhere. So when I go ahead and say zebra mesher, and just let this do its little magic, it's now kind of isolating everything, you're going to see that the geometry is going to change from this really nasty kind of stretchy DynaMesh to this nice even quads. And here, if this isn't low enough, we can actually say there's a half. And I can say retry in 2023. If you're in a previous version, you could just hit zebra measure one more time. And that's going to lower it down even more. And this is, a, this is very workable now. We can see that the quads are nice and even and that it's actually moving along the mesh as best as it can. And now I can bring up subdivisions. And subdivisions, I can either come up here under geometry and hit divide a couple times, or I can just hit control D. And really where I want you to focus on is see how low this number was. If I step back a few times, you'll see that we were working at a dynamic density of 152,000 active polys or quads. Here, that's really dense for such a low model. If I go back forward in time, you'll notice that we actually got it really low. We got it to about 3,000, so very workable for our low resolution. When I step up a couple times, now every time I subdivide by hitting Control-D, it's going to uh, multiply that mesh by four. So I can step up a few times and get right around where I was before, where that detail was nice. And now, with that nice little white dot there, I can actually open up the subtool menu and I can come down to project and we have a feature called project history. So you can actually take the information that you had just a little bit ago and bring it back to your new meshed model. So if I go ahead and say project history, now you, a lot might not have seemed to change, but I'm going to step back before project history. I'll go ahead and stamp this right here. And now this is after. So I brought all of that detail from my DynaMesh model back into a subdivided workable model. And the reason why, again, you want to work with subdivisions is because now if I look at the wireframe, you'll get to see that all of these quads have just nice topology coming through and they're really intersecting. So I can hold more information better at a lower resolution just by stepping up a little bit and getting some nice clean lines. So it's a really great workflow. Now, why is all of this important? I spent 20 minutes coming through and showing you all that workflow is this is the process that you want to start utilizing when you're creating your characters, your environments, or your assets within ZBrush. So from here, I'm going to introduce our new character. His name is Axel Rose. He's a really fun guy. So now this is the process we're going to go ahead and go through with this character. Everything we just did up until that point is what I utilize to build this scene right here. And this scene is super important because we're going to be going ahead and turning around and taking this into Cinema, uh, Cinema 4D and Substance Painter to texture. So to block out our character, let's take our sphere real quick right here. There you go. I'm going to go ahead and say make PolyMesh 3D for this. So now we have our basic sphere. Now we're going to just start blocking this character out. So let's go ahead and turn on DynaMesh. So again, go under Geometry. And we're going to go to DynaMesh, and we're going to drop this number down to say something like 64. Definitely play with the different numbers and the results, but 64 seems to be a relatively low ideal number for it to be. From here now, with we have our little gizmo over here. What I'm going to do is hold Shift. There we go. So now we're going to go ahead, hit X for symmetry, and let's just start blocking them out. So with this guy, and actually too, if again, when we brought up the uh, this, the clone stamp earlier. When we have this character stamped right here, I'm going to go ahead and just stamp them so we can have a reference. I do recommend working in reference if you have it. Reference is super important, especially if you're working with anatomy. We can't remember everything, so it's okay to pull reference. From here, we're going to go ahead and just start coming through and shaping his head a little bit. So I'm going to hit B for brush, M for move, and V. And now I'm just going to come through and start shaping him out. And so when this first stage of blocking out any character, the idea here is that we really just want to kind of take our time and see what the character may or may not look like. With the reference that I have, I want to be able to also work quickly. So another way of working quickly to do some sort of block out, if I come over here and look on the underside, I'm going to introduce a new brush, and that's primitive brushes. So B for brush, and then I for insert, and then we're going to have T for insert multi mesh. And what this is going to do, these are primitive brushes where I can actually drag out a bunch of brushes if I would like to start creating my character. 
And with Dynamesh, what's fun about this is now I can go ahead, come through here, and I can say I need a neck for this character. So I'm gonna insert a new primitive shape. I'm gonna come through and actually use the gizmo hitting W to bring this up. And now I'm gonna use control swipe twice that rebuilds that mesh on the fly. And now that's attached to it. I just welded that piece together. So I can come through and actually maybe add another piece. Let's go ahead and add like a little bit of a shoulder pad. So again, I'm gonna drag this up. I'm gonna hit the move brush, so BMV, and I'm gonna start manipulating this because again, we just wanna be able to kind of come through and start creating something that looks good. Dynamesh, control swipe, and I can hit shift to smooth this down. So I can really just start blocking things out very, very quickly. Now I'm working relatively fast, but again, I always implore people to take their time, but I, this character needs a tail, so I'm gonna drag this out Control swipe rebuilds my mesh. And again, I can preview that. Look how nasty that is, it's not good. But I can go ahead and control swipe, that cleans it up. And now I can smooth this down. And you can see here, I'm already starting to get the results that I want. Now in this stage, when you're doing any type of world building, prop building, environment building, really what you're wanting to do is just focus on the silhouette. It's super important to focus on that because if we focus on anything else, if we get straight to details and the model just kind of looks like the squiggly thing, details on here is not gonna improve that model. So we really wanna make sure that we get the silhouette right. So as I start dragging this out, you can end up getting something that looks a lot like this guy. And now here's the blackout stage. Now I'm kind of approaching this as a cooking show because I'm already 30 minutes in and we went over all the basic things you need to get started with ZBrush but anyone here can start creating today just based on these simple workflows. So now what do I do with this character now that I have him here? So let's actually go through, and let's say he was Dynamesh. So I'm gonna re Dynamesh this guy up because he's actually broken down. So I'm gonna go ahead, delete lower, and I'm just gonna go to that Dynamesh. And again, I'm gonna go ahead and Dynamesh him. So this is what we would have had. And now I wanna dress him up. I want him to look a little bit, uh, you know, he's, he's not really doing all, so let's give him some clothing. So the first thing is, I know we have a jacket here, but we're gonna make something just a little bit simpler for this demo, but it's the same process. If I wanna put a shirt on this guy, we're now gonna introduce masking. I haven't talked about masking this whole time because I didn't wanna throw up too much too quick, but masking is an important tool in ZBrush because it not only protects the surface, like if I mask this area off and I start sculpting, nothing's happening, right? But from here, something is happening. So the thing is, is that masking will help protect the surface, but we can also use masking to utilize assets, to create assets, to go ahead and create something like a t-shirt. So for example, if I come through here and I press and hold control and I go back to this brush palette, Notice how small this brush palette is. This is all my masking brushes right here, just by pressing and holding control. If I go ahead and click the mask lasso, and I make sure symmetry is turned on by pressing X, I can actually come through here and start making something that looks relatively close to a t-shirt. So let's say something like that. Eh, let's make it a little bit longer for him. There we go, say something like such. Uh, maybe a little bit longer here, there we go. So now I have this shape here. How do I make a t-shirt from this mask? There's a really cool feature called Extract. So if I open up the subtool and I come on down to the bottom here, I'm gonna say Extract. Now the way I like to do it is I like to work with any clothing with single-sided geometry because when you're working with clothing, if you have two pieces of geometry rubbing up against each other, the thing is, is that you're gonna tear one side and not the other, it's gonna collide, you're gonna have a lot of problems. So in the beginning, single-sided geometry is really good, but we can control that with this thickness slider. I can decide if it has thickness or if it doesn't. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, you know what? I don't want any thickness, so I'm gonna type in zero. I'm gonna go ahead and say extract. Now, you can't really see what happens, so I'm gonna go ahead and say hit accept, and now you can see it actually created this piece of mesh so if I go ahead and turn on solo, now you can see it created another subtool right up here. So I had my main person right here, there he is. And now I have my shirt. So I just created a secondary piece. Let me run through that one more time. I have this guy up here. 
I'm gonna go ahead and say extract. I'm gonna say accept, and it made another shirt. So this is how I can start dressing my character. I can even put pants on them if I want. So I made this twice. I don't need this, so I'm gonna go ahead and delete this one. I can even come through here and give them some pants. So I can say, you know what, let me clear that mask by pressing control and then just swiping one time out here in space. And I can go ahead and start like, just do a quick block out. Give them a little bit of a, of a tail hole right there. And now I'm gonna go ahead and say extract and then accept. And now this is single sided geometry and this is a pair of pants. Now this mesh right here is the exact same mesh as it is with the actual character himself because it's just taking what I've masked off and duplicating that shape out. But we can go ahead and clean this up using those same zebra mesher tools that I talked about before. And because it's single sided geometry, zebra mesher now doesn't have to guess both sides of the plane. It just has to focus on the one side of the plane. So from here, I can actually come on down. Now this is also masked off. This is something I wanted to point out. This part's masked off, which is really cool. So a little trick is to actually open up deformation and then go here to polish by features. And if you'll notice, it's really kind of wobbly and kind of squiggly. When I polish by features, that cleans that up, that sharpens that edge just a little bit, which is just gonna make Zebra Mesher have an easier time when it rebuilds the surface. Now what I can do, I can clear that mask, control drag, open up geometry, Zebra Mesh, and we're gonna do that same secret sauce. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, let's do about five to 10. Yeah, let's do 10. Let's do adapt, keep groups. I'm gonna drop that to zero, adapt the size down to zero. And now I'm gonna go ahead and say zero mesh that. And you're gonna watch this really nasty mesh kind of clean itself up. And that's a little bit too high. So let's actually go half and go ahead and say zero mesh that again. Let's see how low we can get this. And you can see here, it's actually really nice, e clean, even topology across it. And now what I can do is I can come through here with my gizmo I can actually turn off symmetry and put this right in the middle. And I can even scale this up just a little bit by pressing control, dragging this up. And now I got pants. And if I come up to my other one, my little t-shirt, and I repeat that process one more time. So let's hit solo. And we're just gonna step through it. We're gonna go ahead and actually polish those features real quick. Give me something nice and clean. Geometry, same thing. We're actually gonna start with five now. And I'm gonna say keep groups, keep that down to zero, adaptive size, and zebra mesh. And then I'm gonna say, yeah, let's step it down just a little bit more. There you go, nice, clean topology. And from here, again, same thing. We're just gonna set this in the middle, hold control, scale this up. And now we've started dressing our character. So this is how you could take those steps to get something that looks a little bit more like this guy right here. And this is all I did, I took his hands, Masked them off, made some gloves, took his shirt, made a suit, jacket, pants, like the whole nine yards. That's the process I use to create this one character. So we've made a mushroom together, and now we've, we basically started dressing a character together. The world is pretty much yours when you're working in ZBrush. Whatever you can think of, you can create it within this platform just by following along with these simple tools. So now, how do we actually give them like some props. You notice I have like a belt on here and I have a few other things. So we can actually do hard surface work in ZBrush. And this is something that I think a lot of people really like, once they get into it, they, it's really fun because it's really straightforward. So for example, I actually built the scanner for him because in our final scene, he's sitting on a mushroom and he's contemplating the things that he's seen in the world that we're building for him today. So I went ahead and made him a scanner. Now the scanner might look really, really complicated, but we can actually build this very, very fast. So how do we start building this that's hard surface? I showed you organic, now how do I work in this aspect? So the same approach, but now we're gonna introduce one more tool that's really gonna help bring things together. So I'm gonna create a new, kind of a new, uh, let's bring in a new cylinder. Anytime you wanna bring in a new cylinder to start a new tool, if I click the cylinder right up here, or if I say uh, simple brush, this is actually a 2.5D mode that ZBrush was built on, which allows it to see a lot of geometry. I won't get into that part today, but just know that that is a cool feature. So if you have some time, look up 2.5D. It's really interesting. It's the foundation of how ZBrush functions. But I'm gonna go ahead and say, yeah, let's switch this back to that mode. 
And now here, I'm gonna clear the screen stamp and drag this back out by just clicking one more time. Actually, no, I lied to you. I'm gonna <laughs> grab the simple brush one more time and pick a new primitive and drag that primitive out. There we go. And then I'm gonna go ahead and hit edit. And now at the top, at this moment, I'm in that 2.5D mode that I discussed, but we're gonna skip over that for now and go to make poly mesh 3D, which makes any object sculptable. And now I can work on it. So I can actually manipulate this the way I want, just like we were doing before. But here, what I wanna do is make that scanner. So I'm gonna show you a little trick on how to get some really cool primitives fast. Instead of coming in and maybe inserting, like let's say we wanna insert a cube or we wanna come through and maybe append a, you know, maybe a little bit of a, of a plane. Instead of going this route, what we could always do is whatever object we have, if I hit solo, I can actually open up what's called an insert multi-mesh brush. An insert mesh brush, what it allows us to do is if I grab something, let's say like body parts, for example, and I drag out a new nose, this is different than the VDM brushes I shared. These are actually pre-built uh, meshes that you can bring in as inserts and you can attach them to your character as you want. What's really cool about this is that if there's something like a basic primitive brush, say like this cube, but I have this plane, if I turn the gizmo on and then use, start selecting the different primitives in that brush, I can bring those in and replace the thing that I have. And this is really, really cool when you're just like, oh, I added a sphere, but I meant it to be like a cube. Now you can make that a cube really quickly. I can go ahead and turn the gizmo off and now I can manipulate this or turn it back on and now I can start manipulating this to be something a little bit more like I want. So again, because rotation, moving, manipulating, scaling is all active at the same time, with the gizmo, I can just start coming through and giving me some shapes. Now, this is super low res and this looks nothing like the scanner that I showed you, but that's okay because we're gonna show some tricks on this. So if we come back here, and we're gonna go ahead and just turn this guy around. Now what I'm gonna do, instead of subdividing, which is gonna smooth this down a lot, I don't wanna do that, I'm gonna introduce a brush called the Z Modeler brush. So if I hit B for brush, Z for Z Modeler, and then M, it's down here at the bottom. What this is, is this is our hard surface tool to start constructing and adding and manipulating the shapes that we're working with. So if I hover over a face, a edge, or a point, and I press and hold the space bar, I will get new menus based on what I'm hovering on. This is gonna allow me to manipulate my mesh exactly how I want. Now, if you're looking at this and you're like, Ian, come on, that looks really daunting. What is happening? Right now, look at this as a hierarchy system. At the top, this is number one. This is the polygon action, the thing that we are doing. And every time I pick a new menu, it's going to change the bottom menu, what that target is actually affecting. So if, for example, I wanted to add some extra edge loops, I could say insert, and now from here, I can go ahead and say, I want to insert, oh, I'm sorry, that's an inset. Let's go here, edge loop, insert, there we go, multi-loop, and then I'm gonna say keep groups, I can start inserting new edge loops exactly where I want. And if I come through and I start dragging out like this, and I like that's the one I want, if I come over on this side and tap one time, it's gonna repeat that action. So I can come through, tap, tap, and now I've built this whole thing. So now this actually has more supporting edge loops so I can sculpt on this or manipulate this however I want. So if I start subdividing now, you'll see the rounding isn't as severe. The same thing goes for faces. If I come through and hover over a face and I say I want a Q mesh or extrude, let's say maybe just a single group, I can extrude this out. And in combination with masking by pressing control, dragging, and then maybe tapping invert using the gizmo, I can actually make custom shapes real quickly by just pulling that out, coming through, mask this section off, and maybe blow this up, manipulate that shape. I can start making weird custom shapes how I want. Now with this, with this scanner that I built, how I built this one was actually in combination with a new feature called, well, not new feature, it's been there a while, called Live Boolean. So where what I can do is with something that's this low, and let's go ahead and give us just a couple loops, I can go ahead and duplicate this, and I'm gonna put this in a folder. I'm gonna hit Control F, that's gonna put it in a folder for me. I'll call this my scanner body. I say okay, and I'm gonna put the second one in. Now I'm gonna use the gizmo, bring this up. Now we can't see anything yet, so let's go ahead and shut off the things that we don't need. And now I'm gonna scale this down. 
bring this up. And if I turn on live Boolean, nothing happens. That's okay. What we're going to do is now focus on the cutting tool that we're going to be manipulating. Make sure that's on the bottom or underneath the object we want to cut. And when I go ahead and look at this tool, you'll see here I have this like little union uh, icon. And then I have what looks like something that's being cut out and then something that's intersecting. So if I choose the cutout one, hide my wireframe, I can now come in and start making those custom shapes. I can even press and hold control and duplicate that mesh. And I can start actually start making my custom shapes. So I can come through and actually cut in. And this doesn't just work with the object itself. Anything that's actually set to cutting will make this type of cut. And if I'm done and I like this, I can come through here on the folder itself, hold this little gear icon and say Boolean folder. Boop. And now it's gonna go ahead and it's gonna cut my mesh up for me, giving me something that looks a little bit like this. And this is the approach that I had when I was making all of these custom shapes here. Now I'm kind of running out of time a little bit. So what I wanna do is kind of make sure that we get into the substance painter part of the character creation. I wanted to just make sure that the getting started was really cool. If you guys have questions, you can always see me afterwards. But again, there's a lot of different ways to manipulate the meshes and the shapes that you're going through. Now, when we're gonna go ahead and let's say we finished everything that we liked and we wanna start bringing things together, this is where we're gonna take to the next step of the creation process and move into texturing. ZBrush is a AAA standard industry sculpting program and it works really well with other programs like Substance Painter, Cinema 4D, Redshift, even Unreal Engine. So this is like the foundation of most character creation building process. But then what happens when we take this and we throw it off into something else? How do we get there? So for something like this, we're actually gonna establish a really cool system, which is right here, a little bit more clean cut. We have the character. And you'll notice here on the side, I have things broken up between a head, some eyes. I also have his body, his jacket, and they're all kind of color coded. This is actually gonna help me build what's called an ID map, which is gonna help texturing a lot better when I move this over into Substance Painter. I also have this named head underscore high, eyes underscore high, so I broke up all the pieces that make the most sense, so when I move it over, we can bake those details on. And then I created a low version of him. Now the low version of him has UVs, and the UVs is what's gonna help kind of wrap the textures on the actual character. When you think of UVs, I want you to think of a candy wrapper, especially those nice little Easter chocolates where it's like you unfold that nice little wrapper, grab the chocolate. Well, all the texturing, all the painting that's on that wrapper, that's about how UVs work. That's like the simplest version of explaining it. So here, because we're working with something that's gonna go into a game engine, I created with Z-Remesher a low version of all of my assets from the actual pouches, the belt, the pants, all the stuff we kind of talked about, how you can build all that within ZBrush. I went ahead and built all those, and I Z-remeshed them to get them nice and low. And then I focused on all the texturing here, so you can see all the wrinkles, the nice cuts, and stuff like that. And this is what the information I want on my low to create my normal maps, my uh, and my height maps, et cetera, et cetera. So, now that we have this character kind of built, let's go ahead and what you would do with all this is you would actually export this out as an FBX. An FBX I like to call is like the, the PDF of 3D. It's basically universal across almost every DCC you'll ever operate in. So when you're thinking about like, oh, how can I export stuff out? You can usually turn to FBX, OBJ is pretty standard. But in this case, because I'm working with multiple assets that's gonna be thrown into Substance Painter, I'm actually gonna use FBX because it can hold multiple files at the same time, not just one at a time and I don't have to merge it all together. So I would come up here, let's say my low resolution, I would actually come on up here and I would go and say export. And now here I'd pick where I want this to be. So I'm actually gonna come through, awesome presenters for the day. And I would say that this is my test. And now this is set to FBX. And then I would say save. And now we get a couple options. So once up here at the top, we have selected, meaning any subtool you have selected, that's the one that's gonna get exported, but that's only one subtool. And I have like five or six that I wanna bring with me. So I, my other options are visible, meaning anything that I see in the viewport, that's what is gonna be in the FBX, or all, everything. Whether I hit it or whether I not, this is how it's gonna be exported, FBX will pick it up. 
I like to stay with visible. And then the defaults, we usually choose the best defaults for you, so you don't have to play with them too, too much. But with FBX 2020, that's about where it's at. Maya Y up, if you're gonna move this over into something like Maya, you can go ahead. This is pretty, pretty default for you out the gate. So we would say, okay, and we just let it think for a little bit and it would say file exported. So now we wanna bring this in to Substance Painter to do our texture work. So I'm gonna go ahead and I have him kind of loaded up here, but that's not gonna be helpful. So let me show you how to go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and file new. And here you might see some settings. I'm gonna go ahead and first select the file that I want. So I have a low version right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and say open. Now the naming convention too, I'm gonna to kind of default call out because I like to use underscore capitalization. And if you capitalize certain things and lowercase others, that could actually confuse the baking process when you move it over into Substance Painter. So I like to stick with, a, with either caps or lowercase. Up to you, no way is wrong. You can all eat the Reese's however you want. Here, I'm gonna say low. I'm gonna open this up. And then it's just asking me what document size I actually wanna work in. You can work in 1K, you can work in 2K. I like to work in 2K. It's usually a nice one to get all the textures looking pretty close. You can always step up and bake out at, at 4K or 8K. And then OpenGL is pretty default. The rest of this, I'm not gonna bore you with that. We'll just go ahead and say okay. And no changes to be made on this. So now here's our character that we moved in from ZBrush. And now we wanna go ahead and texture him. Now real quick, before I go too far, I do wanna say that when you texture anything that's T-posed like this or A-posed, that's because he's gonna be animated. But once he starts moving, once we get the textures on him, it doesn't matter once he starts moving, as long as you don't break the mesh or break the UV, the texture will work even if he's like has his hands up or has his arms on the side, but it's easier to work with him in symmetry mode. And now from here, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna focus on this little croissant right here. This is our baking, and I love that it's a nice little piece of food, that's how I can remember it. And then I'm gonna go ahead and just do a couple steps. Now remember in ZBrush, I had them colored blue, green, yellow, red, orange, random colors. Those colors are gonna help me bring in an ID map with the vertex colors that we provided. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, I wanna bake him at 4K, and I wanna bring in my high, so I'm gonna come up here to the high uh, definition meshes, and this is where my high map comes in. Your high mesh, as long as it's identical in its shape and size, doesn't have to have UVs when you bake it. The low model has to have the UVs in order for this to work. But if your high doesn't have the proper UVs on it, that's okay. This is just gonna pull all the sculptural details that we spent working on in ZBrush. And then I'm gonna go to ID map, and I'm gonna say vertex color. Because ZBrush works with poly paint, it's all vertex coloring. This is a new way to start creating a map. Now you'll notice that it kind of created a little bit of a cage. And I have a bunch of maps here on the side, but I'm just gonna select, I only need normal map, ID map, maybe ambient inclusion, maybe curvature, position, no worries, thickness for subsurface scatter. And now I'm gonna go ahead and say, let's go ahead and let's get, let's get a couple more rays here. I like to bake this at 100 for ambient inclusion, just some random settings, but that vertex color, that's the key for the ID map. Now, if we come back to common settings, you'll see here that I'm actually getting a cage that is wrapping around my character. This frontal distance is actually telling me that this is the distance I want those sculptural details to be baked onto the low model. And if it basically, if it breaks, so if I hold look at this and I push this down and you start seeing red, this is where we're gonna see a little bit of errors. This is substance saying, no, 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 don't do this. So we're gonna actually push this up a little bit until we don't see red. And then we're gonna do this live, so give us a second, but we're gonna hit bake, just cause I wanna see, just want you to see that now it's gonna look at our ZBrush model, our high texture sculptural models, that, uh, details that we provided from ZBrush. It's looking at all my maps, and now it's gonna go through and start baking that process out. And this is where your character really starts coming to life and it really starts popping. So already in just 15 minutes, what we were able to do was showcase how to start in ZBrush how to start really working with some of the tools, experiment, play around, dress our character, little bit of hard surface, didn't go too much into it, but just a little bit to kind of get your feet wet with a new brush. And now we're in here getting into the next stage, which is texturing. This is where it's really gonna bring all of that stuff to life. So with ZBrush workflow from there into Substance, you really can start getting a lot of that in working very quickly. And as you can see here, our character's starting to pop a little bit with ambient occlusion, it's starting to give us that stuff. 
And in just a couple minutes, I'll show you real quick how you can throw some uh, materials on there, make it pop, and then I'll show you what the final result was before I hand it off to Ellie, who's gonna take all the things that I just built and move it into Cinema 4D with some world creation on that side and then Redshift as well. Real quick, does anybody have any questions here in the front? You guys good? Cool, all right, so at that point, you saw some of the colors pop through. It's almost done. It's a little bit of a long bake, but this is what's cool about being an artist is that when you start doing stuff like this, go brew some coffee, go grab a soda, go <laughs> basically just go and get something to drink. And as it comes through, it's gonna go through and just kind of really reset. What's also cool that I'll point out is that you can tell right away if this isn't gonna look good. When it's baking through, if you set your cage right, it'll show you that like kind of checkered pattern. If it starts looking funky and then the colors aren't lining up, the shadows don't line up right, you know it's not good. And you'll just go back in the ZBrush and kind of correct the model a little bit and then send it back over. So a little bit of a back and forth dance, but you can get some really nice clean results just like this. And it's almost done, I promise. Not to bore you guys too much. There we go. It's just doing the belt now. There we go. And now this is what he looked like baked. So now our character's starting to really, really pop. And if I want to just add some materials to start getting that look, if I come back over to this paintbrush, you can see here now I can actually pick between regular materials or what's known as smart materials. I can come through and say, oh, he's going to need some fabric on his jacket. There we go. And then there's some uh, creature skin brush, so maybe I'll throw in that kind of material. Again, I can dress him up however I want. But if I really quickly just open up my first file right here, I can come through and you'll see how he basically looks right now before we move to the next step, which is handing it over for more character building. And then what's cool is when you're done with this and you went ahead and you textured your character, what you can do is you can pop back over to ZBrush and you can pose him. And so for example, if we wanted to pose him, how we can do this it's because this is the low version, I'm gonna show you a quick plugin real fast, which is called Z plugin and it's called Transpose Master. And I have T-Pose Mesh. If I click this T-Pose Mesh, it basically merges all my subtools into one subtool. And now what I can do with everything we talked about from masking and the gizmo is I can actually come through, mask the selection. I can press and uh, hold control and tap one time. And I can actually move this gizmo off over here in space. And now I can come through and start posing him. I can even soften my mask by pressing, holding control and tap a couple times. And I can move his arm. I can come through and actually maybe move his tail a little bit. So just some like kind of simple examples. Kind of move this down here. And we can move him just off over in this direction. I can even use brushes. I don't have to just use the gizmo. I can actually bend this here. But again, I just wanna make sure that when I'm coming through that I'm not really breaking him too much. I can even isolate, because we have polygroups, mentioned polygroups earlier, it's different colors. With the polygroups on by pressing Shift F, if I press Shift and Control and tap, I can isolate just that one, mask it off, come through here, maybe just isolate just a couple pieces, and then I can start moving or scaling. I wanna be careful with the scale. Okay, so from there, you can get something that looks a lot like this. Thank you guys very much.